Good day to you all, dear ones, and welcome to this 31st day of October. It is day 304 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name is Hunter. I am your brother and your Bible reading coach, somebody who shows up with you every day to spend a little time together in the pages of the Bible. And we're going to let this Bible point the way to the one who is the living Word of God, the one alone who has the words of life. If you're new here, I want to welcome you, let you know that we try and keep it simple. We simply read through the scriptures and we take a little time to reflect upon them and pray. We take a little time for our soul. So we are so glad that you have chosen to join us for a little soul work today. That's going to start in Job 22. And then we'll go on to Mark's Gospel, chapters 7 and 8. I'm glad you're here. Job 22. Eliphaz's has his third response to Job. Then Eliphaz the Temanite replied, Can a person do anything to help God? Can even a wise person be helpful to him? Is it any advantage to the Almighty if you are righteous? Would it be any gain to him if you were perfect? Is it because you're so pious that he accuses you and brings judgment against you? No, it's because of your wickedness. There's no limit to your sins. For example, you must have lent money to your friend and then demanded clothing as security. Yes, you stripped him to the bone. You must have refused water for the thirsty and food for the hungry. You probably think the land belongs to the powerful and only the privileged have a right to it. You must have sent widows away empty-handed and crushed the hopes of orphans. That is why you are surrounded by traps and tremble from sudden fears. That is why you cannot see in the darkness and waves of water cover you. God is so great, higher than the heavens, higher than the farthest stars. But you reply, that's why God can't see what I'm doing. How can he judge through this thick darkness? For thick clouds swirl about him, and he cannot see us. He is way up there, walking on the vault of heaven. Will you continue on the old paths where evil people have walked? They were snatched away in the prime of life, the foundations of their lives washed away. For they said to God, Leave us alone. What can the Almighty do to us? Yet he was the one who filled their homes with good things, so I will have nothing to do with that kind of thinking. The righteous will be happy to see the wicked destroyed, and the innocent will laugh in contempt. They will say, See how our enemies have been destroyed. The last of them have been consumed in the fire. Submit to God, and you will have peace. Then things will go well for you. Listen to his instructions and store them in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. So clean up your life. If you give up your lust for money and throw your precious gold into the river, the Almighty himself will be your treasure. He will be your precious silver. Then you will take delight in the Almighty and look up to God. You will pray to him and he will hear you and you will fulfill your vows to him. You will succeed in whatever you choose to do and light will shine on the road ahead of you. If people are in trouble and you say, help them, God will save them. Even sinners will be rescued. They will be rescued because your hands are pure. Mark 7 One day as some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand-washing before eating. The Jews, especially the Pharisees, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands as required by their ancient traditions. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market until they immerse their hands in water. This is but one of many traditions they have clung to, such as their ceremonial washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, Why don't your disciples follow our age-old traditions? They eat without first performing their hand-washing ceremony. Jesus replied, You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. Then he said, 
you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own tradition. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God, honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, it is all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you let them disregard their needy parents, and so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is only one example among many others. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. Then Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowd, and his disciples asked him what he meant by the parable he had just used. Don't you understand either, he asked. Can't you see that the food you put in your body cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. By saying this, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. And then he added, It is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre. He didn't want anyone to know which house he was staying in, but he couldn't keep it a secret. Right away, a woman who had heard about him came and fell at his feet. Her little girl was possessed by an evil spirit, and she begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. Since she was a Gentile born in Syria, Phoenicia, Jesus told her, First, I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied, That's true, Lord, but even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plates. Good answer, he said. Now go home, for the demon has left your daughter. And when she arrived home, she found her little girl lying quietly in bed, and the demon was gone. Jesus left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Ten Towns. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. Jesus led him away from the crowd so that they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears, then, spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Afafatha, which means be opened. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly, and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone. But the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. They were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. Mark 8 About this time another large crowd had gathered and the people ran out of food again. Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They have been here with me for three days, and they have nothing left to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will faint along the way, for some of them have come a long distance. His disciples replied, How are we supposed to find enough food to feed them out here in the wilderness? Jesus asked, How much bread do you have? Seven loaves, they replied. So Jesus told all the people to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves, thanked God for them, and broke them into pieces. He gave them to his disciples who distributed the bread to the crowd. A few small fish were found too, so Jesus also blessed these and told the disciples to distribute them. They ate as much as they wanted. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven large baskets of leftover food. There were about 4,000 men in the crowd that day. And Jesus sent them home after they had eaten. Immediately after this, he got into a boat with his disciples and crossed over to the region of Dalmanutha. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had arrived, they came and started to argue with him. Testing him, they demanded that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. When he heard this, 
He sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why do these people keep demanding a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth. I will not give this generation any such sign. So he got back into the boat and he left them, and he crossed to the other side of the lake. But the disciples had forgotten to bring any food. They had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. As they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, Watch out. Beware the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. At this they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, Why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? When I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread, how many baskets of leftovers did you pick up afterward? Twelve, they said. And when I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves, how many large baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Seven, they said. Don't you understand yet? He asked them. When they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus, and they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then, spitting on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and asked, Can you see anything now? The man looked around. Yes, he said. I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were opened. His sight was completely restored, and he could see everything clearly. Jesus sent him away, saying, Don't go back into the village on your way home. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. And as they were walking along, he asked them, Who do people say that I am? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, and others say you're one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Peter replied, You are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples Then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And now may our Lord Jesus give his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. We have a tale of two loaves, it seems. Two times in this one chapter we are confronted with a shortage of bread. There's not enough bread for the crowds, and there's not enough bread for the twelve as they're sailing on the boat. As Jesus looks out over the hungry multitude, he asks his disciples, How much bread do you have? And they respond that they have seven loaves. Seven loaves for thousands. And that is not enough. Later, they're back in the boat. And Jesus hears them talking about the one loaf of bread that they have. They realize that they don't have enough bread with that one loaf among the twelve disciples. And this time Jesus' response seems cryptic. He says, Beware the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Yeast expands. It makes something appear bigger than it is. It inflates. 
And Jesus is reminding them that the powers of religion and the world and politics, it's like yeast. It expands, it inflates, it's deceitful in its appearance and its effects. And he tells them, beware, this bread cannot sustain you. It will not be enough, it will not deliver, it will not feed everyone. There's not enough bread. There's not enough bread in this life. We will always come up short and we will always end up fainting on the journey. Our bread, whether it's the seven loaves for the multitude or the one yeast-filled loaf, it's not enough. What we need is the bread of life. Jesus is saying that he alone is the bread of life. Jesus says, don't be deceived. Beware. What we need is what God alone can provide. We need the bread that comes down from heaven. When we have his bread, there's always enough. In fact, there's bread left over, basketfuls. This reading is a tale of two loaves of bread. Seven loaves for the crowd, not enough. One loaf for the twelve, not enough. Only he is enough. In fact, he's more than enough. And he's the bread we need each day. We need the healing, sustaining bread of life. So let's partake. Let's come to him. Let's rely on what he alone can give. And what he gives is himself. And that's a prayer that I have for my own soul. That's a prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, my son. And that's a prayer that I have for you. May it be so. We continue now with our time of prayer. You can find these prayers in the show notes of today's podcast. I invite you now to read along with those prayers, or you can also just meditate on these words that are being spoken over you on behalf of our life in Jesus. And now, let us pray. Lord God, Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we might not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit on all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I might not seek so much to be consoled, as to console, to be understood, as to understand, to be loved, as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, in the pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in the dying that we are born unto eternal life. Amen. And now as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Loving God, 
We give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food. Now send us forth as forgiven people, healed and renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ. Amen. Well, thank you very much for joining me in that time of prayer. And I also want to commend you for spending another perfectly good 20 minutes investing into your soul. Doing this soul work, I'm convinced, will lead us into a life of greater peace, clarity, hopefulness, joy, and even love. So let's keep tending to those things that are worth tending to. On a different note altogether, I would love for you to head on over to YouTube, if you haven't done this already, and subscribe to our podcast there. That's right, YouTube now has podcasts. And already we're starting to see a number of folks listening via YouTube every day. And growing our visibility there on YouTube is, in part, a response to our subscribers. Now, I'm not asking you to listen to the podcast via YouTube, but your subscriptions there actually do help others to find what we're doing there so that they too can join in on this journey. So again, it is a long explanation, but it is a big help when you subscribe to our various channels, including this one here, this YouTube channel. Well, all these channels that we are able to utilize in this mission are brought to you by the incredible blessing of partners. These are our listeners who have come alongside Heather and I, and they have given, and they've prayed, and they've joined in. And I'm so grateful, so I just want to send a shout out and say thank you to folks like Craig and Shelby Hildall, to David and Julie Neveu, to Christina Blaney, Samantha Goodwin, Jan Longnecker, Florence Atiga, Pam Yesian, Pamela Curry, and Ama December. Blessings to you all, my sisters and my brothers. So glad that we can serve together in this important way. And if you're listening today and you would like to join in with that group of folks, man, that is so appreciated. All you need to do is head on over to the webpage, dailyradiobible.com, click on the donate link. Or if you're old school and you want to do things through the U.S. Post, you can reach us at Daily Radio Bible, 2748 Northeast Molini Way, Hillsboro, Oregon, 97124. Hey, what do you say we show up again here and do this again tomorrow? That's my plan. Lord willing and the creek don't rise, your brother Hunter plans on being here. Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength and let us always remember this, that you are loved. No doubt about that. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.